Grace, peace, and mercy to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, you have um, probably heard the term of a mountaintop experience. Um, usually it's describing some sort of religious experience, uh, maybe as a group, something memorable, something uh, exciting, something that would fill you with awe. Um, a mountaintop experience comes, and, and, and it's an appropriate title, I suppose, um, even based upon our two readings that we have before us today. Um, they were literally on a mountain, and uh, uh, they experienced the presence of God in a, in a dynamic, wonderful, exciting, uh, powerful way. Um, I, I don't know if you would describe that of yourself. Maybe you would. Maybe you would be able to recall some time in your memory where um, you've experienced some sort of mountaintop experience with God. Um, maybe it was uh, some sort of uh, large group worship setting. Maybe it was something uh, in nature where you were uh, in the presence of God or you felt that. Um, regardless of whether you interpreted or felt or experienced something like that or not, um, I'd like to remind you and maybe even, maybe, even, um, maybe even invite you to consider the more uh, routine, the more... Um, I don't know if we'll call it mundane, but, but the more routine and regular, constant presence of God. Uh, because here's the problem that we kind of find ourselves into, is that sometimes we see God is present in those great experiences, but then we, we kind of begin to live like he's not present in the everyday. And so we kind of separate God out, that he's there in the uh, worship time, uh, or he's there in that dynamic experience, but he's not there when I'm having an argument with my wife. Or he's there in this exciting time when things are glorious and wonderful and pretty and, and fascinating, uh, but he's not there when I'm having a hard time uh, at work. Um, and th and that, that's our challenge. That, that's our big challenge. So let, me, let me just spend a little time with you uh, thinking through, talking through both of our readings today. And as we look at that, maybe we take a look at both of those readings and see how, how God then applies those words in our everyday. First one is the Old Testament reading, and it's probably maybe somewhat familiar uh, to some of us. It's this uh, opportunity where Moses is invited to celebrate this covenant partnership, this covenant with God's people. Um, and it kind of goes like this. So, so the people are uh, hearing God's word, they're hearing the commandments, and they are having them read, and they're saying, we're in. We will be your people, God. And God is responding by saying, I will continue to be your God. And so the commandments are there, and they say, yes, we will obey. We are your people, God. We are your chosen people, and God is responding by saying, yes, and I am your God. And this is a pretty fascinating, incredible thing, because they know that the God that they are a part of now is the God of creation. He's the God that uh, rescued them. He's the God that created them. He's the God that made the sun and the moon and the stars. And so now, because this God of creation has chosen to be their God, this is an incredible partnership that they have. And the covenant is now uh, made confirmed. Sacrifices are made. Blood is shed. The blood is uh, sprinkled upon the altar of God. And then it's sprinkled upon the people of God. Symbolizing and knowing that they are now covered by the blood of the covenant. It's confirmed. Sounds like an odd way to do that in today's world, but in that time, it was the most powerful way to confirm this covenant. And so then the story goes, uh, here they are, the people of God, and so now God has invited Moses and the 70 elders, the leaders of the church, to represent the church, to come up the mountain and to be with him. Now this is a shocking uh, and even terrifying prospect. Now imagine for just a minute um, that if we were to then try to approach the sun itself, right, the shiny sun, um, we know that we can't do that because we would be burned up before we ever got close. Well now, what they're invited is that the God who made the sun, the creator of the sun, is inviting them to come close and to be with him. Now what they knew is that they would be burned up, they're sinful people, this is a holy God 
uh, they, they would never survive such a thing. But the text is very specific and says, no, they were invited to come into his presence. It even says more than that. It says that they, they invited to have a covenant meal in the presence of God. They ate and drank with him. So they're hanging out with God, right? They're having a meal with God, a covenant meal. And the covenant meal was known. It was something that was common, right? That they would even have like the Passover meal where there'd be various foods and there'd be wine and there'd be time to relax and rest in the presence. And now they're resting in the presence of the almighty God and they survived it. In fact, they enjoyed it. It's a pretty incredible thing. Um, this text right here in these last words, and they had a covenant meal with God and they ate and drank with him. It's probably one of the most significant reminders of God in the presence of the people and the people in the presence of God. And remember, they, they had promised to be his people and God had promised to be their God. And now they confirmed it by this hanging out together. But then what happens next? If you were to read the text, um, you could see that right after this new chapter, new event, the leaders come back down the mountain and they find the whole golden calf incident. If you're unfamiliar with that, it's uh, the fact that the people of God, the ones that had just promised to be the people of God, um, they say that they took off their gold and they threw it in a, uh, melted it down, threw it in an oven and, and out popped a, a golden calf. Um, right, suddenly shocked uh, as they were. Well, they were worshiping another God that they had created. Because now this God that had promised to be their God, the God of creation, and they had promised to be the people of God, how quickly they forgot. And the leaders, how quickly they forgot. Because they got involved in all the arguing and the discussion and the difficulty, and they were filled with disgust and hate uh, for even the people, the beloved people of God. It was a mess. Right, they're in the presence of God, they come down the mountain, and they walk right into a terrible mess, a mess of sin. Now we talk about the New Testament reading, the Gospel reading. Similar story, um, maybe a, a bit of a different twist, um, but now Jesus is there, and Jesus is inviting Peter, James, and John to come up uh, on this mountain with him. And while they're up on the mountain with him, he is transfigured. He looks different. His face is shining like the sun that he created. And his clothes are uh, brilliant, bright white. He's revealing himself as truly God. And God the Father then speaks from heaven and says, this is my son. He confirms it. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And of course, when the voice is booming, they're all terrified. It says they fall on their face. Uh, Peter, being the spokesperson right before that, says, I know what to do. Uh, I'll build some three shelters for you and Moses and Elijah, who are now appearing with Jesus. Um, so now the creator of the sun itself needs shade from the sun itself. Peter didn't know what to say. Um, and it is kind of a strange kind of response that Peter has. So before he even finished speaking, that's when God speaks and says, this is my son. So, so the covenant... The promise is being confirmed by God. This is my son. This is the one. Listen to him. So they experience the presence of the almighty God in the person of Jesus Christ. And, and it's obviously an incredible experience. Peter and the others, they want to stay there. They want to hang out. They want to just spend some time there together. And then they head down the mountain. Jesus tells them not to say anything to anyone until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. So hold your tongue until I rise from the grave, and then you can tell everybody. Um, but, you know, if you're reading the text, you see after this incredible experience, they come back down the mountain, and immediately the disciples are arguing among one another about who's the greatest. Jesus corrects them, and he talks about children and having the children come, and then Jesus lays out in Matthew 18... Okay, this is how you deal with those sinners among you. And he lays out this step-by-step -step approach of dealing with sinful people. They walk back into a mess. They themselves are a mess. It's like they're there in the presence of God, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The people of God, they say, I'm, I'm your guy, I'm your person, right? I'm your people, you're my God. We're resting in your presence, we're eating and drinking in your presence um, we're celebrating in your presence, and then we walk back out. They walk back down the mountain, and they go right back 
to the mess of sin like it never happened at all. I think this has some application to us. Here's, uh, here's what we do. Um, you uh, got up this morning and you drove through the snow again to come to church and you come into this building and you walk in the building and you're in the presence of God. Kind of like the children's message, right? You're coming and you're witnessing God at work. And, um, and of course, well, you can't see him. He's not visibly present with us. But we know that this is where God works. This is where he does his thing. This is where his presence is known. If we're going to look for him, we can look for him in a lot of different places. But we know that we can look for him and find him here. Um, today, for example, we see this dear family baptized. God's working. Right? God, God's present. He's here joining them to his family. Uh, as you either witness or even come yourself to eat and drink in his presence, to have this covenant meal in the presence of God, he's working. We know he's here. Uh, even even very, at a very young age, we kind of recognize that this is where God is present. Um, we were up in Sioux Falls um, over the last week. Penn was there for a week. I was there for a couple of days. And I can't remember exactly... Uh, the context of the conversation, but we were talking, um, and, uh, and, and the kids were talking, and, and Jonah um, was explaining to somebody in the middle of, they're talking about just the presence of God, and Jonah, he's almost four, and so he knows everything, um, and so in the middle of the conversation, he goes, stop, stop, wait, wait, it was at preschool, yes, where do we find Jesus? And, and, and so it's preschool and it's grandparents day and, and the teacher's leading and reading a book and, and all the kids have these different responses. And of course, our, our grandson says, stop, wait, wait, wait. And the room gets quiet and he says, we find him at church. And it's true. It's not the only place we find him. But we come because God works here. Not, but, but here, right? In, in the word and sacraments. But then we uh, typically, uh, we do this, we walk back out, we have this presence of God, whether we call it a mountaintop experience or not, um, we come to this mountain and we eat and drink in his presence and we celebrate his presence and we sing praises in the presence of God and, 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 and we do that together as a, as a church, as his people, and then we walk right back out the door and we get back into our cars and it's like it never happened at all. And sometimes we, just like these people we're reading about, walk right back into the mess of sin, maybe even the mess of our own sin, and we somehow think that God is absent. We somehow think that he's not present in our marriage, our home, our family. Somehow we think that he's not present in our workplace or in the relationship with our neighbors. Sometimes we think he's not present in our bedroom or in our living room. Right? Sometimes we think that he is, he is absent from us as his people, and we kind of like it that way. Because we can do what we do, and we can live our lives in a different way, or in a way that uh, might be unbe unbecoming of us as Christians, because you know what's happening? Next week we can come back again. And the following Sunday we get back in and we drive through the snow again, and we come to church, and we come, and we come into the presence of God, and we celebrate his presence and we tuck him back away and we leave and go back to our lives. It's just not true. Look back, maybe remember with me back at, um, at the Old Testament reading. As God's covenant is being presented to the people, they said, we are yours, God. And God said, and I'm your God. And the disciples, as they went up on the mountain and they followed Jesus, they were his disciples. They come and then whether they were on the mountain or off the mountain, they're his followers. They're followers of God. They were his people. They promised to be his people. And he promised to be their God. And today we even witness, well, this family coming and they're, they're coming, they're being baptized and they're saying, we're your people, God. And God shows them by washing them clean of sins and joining them to his family. And they say, and I am your God and I'll be with you always. And you stand up before God and you confess your sins. You stand up before God and you speak the creed. You stand up before God and you receive his gifts. You eat and drink in his presence. And you say, I am a Christian. I am your people, God. And he says, and I promise to be your God. And whether you're here worshiping him 
or whether you're out in your home, among your family, or your workplace, or your neighbor, or in your bedroom, or your living room, or in your car, you are his people, and he is your God. To offer you the forgiveness of sins, and to offer you uh, an opportunity to see how he continues to work through your hands, and your feet, and your mouth, and your lives, because... Because the God of all creation, the God that created the sun and the moon and the stars, is also your Savior. He's also one that goes with you. He's also the one that fills your heart, fills you with the Holy Spirit, that he would be with you always. Here, and there, and everywhere. Amen. It's great to worship with you again today. We continue our worship with an opportunity to give our tithes and offerings to the Lord. And also we continue our worship as we celebrate with this dear family as they are joined through the waters of baptism. <laughs>